Hello everyone and welcome to today's Lux webinar. My name is John Bullock. I'm Applications Editor at Lux Review and I'm your host for today and I'm overjoyed to say that we are going to be talking about power over Ethernet and the reason I'm overjoyed is because we did this last year. We talked about this, uh, this new idea of, uh, of being able to distribute power around a building in a very clever way and we have Dwight Stewart of Eagle back with us this year to tell us what's happened over the last 12 months and, and where this technology is going. Hello, Dwight. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good morning. Or at least good morning good. from the United States Central Time. Yeah, and how is Iowa today? It's uh, beautiful. Uh, it's just waking up. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, we've got a bit of sunshine here in the south of England as well. And and joining us here today, um, is, we have Cliff White, who's president of cottage senior living which puts him in the role of an end user and what we know is that when we talk about new technologies the one thing that we want to hear about is how the stuff is being used and how people are getting on with it uh cliff i have to i have to warn everyone that cliff's got a little bit of a sore voice today so uh we have to treat him gently but cliff how are you good morning i'm doing fine thank you john okay great now, before we get underway, let me, for the uh, the newcomers to the platform, let me just explain what you've got on your screen in front of you. Um, it's pretty obvious where the slides are going to come up from because it says slides on it. And in the top right-hand corner of that little window, you can see um, the enlarging box so you can fill your screen with it. Um, also on there, you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner the Ask a Question box. If you've got a question for, for Dwight or for Cliff or for me, um, please type it into there. Hit the send button. Please be aware it comes to me. It doesn't go to the other guys. So I'm the one who will be uh, looking after all those questions. And when we get to the Q&A at the end, that's where we'll start picking up the questions there. Rather than uh, try and disturb someone midway through a presentation, which is, which is never a good thing. So... Um, that's that bit. What else have we got? Uh, obviously, if anything happens and your, your screen freezes, the best thing in the top left-hand corner is your refresh button. That tends to get you out of a hole. But if you find that you're still stuck, do, again, use the Ask a Question to give us a clue if there's something going on for you. So um, I think that'll do from me for the time being. Dwight, it's over to you. Well, thanks, John. I'll... Uh Good to have the opportunity to talk to everyone today. Um, so I'm Dwight Stewart, the founder and CTO of Igor. Uh, just a little bit about my background, uh, just add some context. I started a uh, company back in 2003 that integrated with many different building control systems and, uh, you know, like BACnet, Modbus, and, and all sorts of uh, different protocols that are used within buildings and then brought that to an analytic portal, and then apps could be developed on top of that. And we had a great success over a course of six years, increased to 40 employees, and we're doing sites across the United States and, and even outside of the United States. But uh, the U.S. Capitol Complex, everything but the White House, uh, we were monitoring uh, major universities like Harvard, Duke, and Yale, uh, as well as very large uh, skyscrapers and like uh, the 30 largest skyscrapers in San Francisco. Uh, we were helping reduce the energy uh, for these different facilities. Uh, in the case of San Francisco, an entire power plant worth of energy was saved, and that was during the blackouts and brownouts of California uh, in the early 2000s. So with that experience, you know, I ended up selling that company off and uh, we had very uh, a lot of interest from different organizations, one of those being Cisco Systems, and ended up uh, not selling the company to Cisco, but maintained a very strong relationship with them. And about six years ago, received a phone call from them about what they saw as an opportunity with Power Over Ethernet, really disrupting the LED market, where it can have a transformative impact uh, in, in so many different ways. And, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, the other thing that we'll be talking about is the opportunity um, and, and the technology stack uh, and, and the end user cases as well as security. So first off, um, let's talk about the status quo. So if we go to uh, just looking at a building today, 
it's really just a, a meticulously planned custom collection of fixed assets. And basically what I mean by that is there's a lot of planning. It's a very uh, systematic and, and uh, because people expect that this is the way the building's going to be forever. So you really need to plan that out to the nth degree. And then these are all individual assets that are put into this building, but not necessarily meant to work together. And they're all going to stay in one place forever. Um, and it really what that ends up being is, you know, limited, expensive, and inflexible. And so limited in the sense that it just provides very basic functions. It also is usually proprietary, so those systems don't talk well to one another. There's no intelligence, and, and so thereby you're not gaining any added benefit or, or value on, on top of that, and you're not to, able to learn from the system because there's usually no data, and if there is, it's very limited and, and uh, basic. And then from a standpoint of labor, it, it, it's very intensive because – it's using AC wiring typically. And when that's being done, it, you have certain labor classes that have to do that, number one. But number two, there's a lot of materials that have to go in, into that. And those materials can't just change. If you wanted to move something later, those materials have to be ripped out or, or uh, you know, at least at some portion of that has to be ripped out and reapplied. And so it's not something, it's not a very flexible infrastructure at all. Uh, and then from a standpoint of, you know, that's a wasteful process, uh, just having to, to go through that infrastructure change. But in addition, without data, you don't have an idea as to what's going on in, in your uh, facility. And you know, we recently did a case study where for an apartment building, we did a deployment. We set the uh, corridors to being a five-minute timeout for the occupancy and this was in the suburbs where you wouldn't expect much activity in the middle of the mornings. But what we found is that after the install, two weeks after it, we looked back at the data, we only saved 70% energy from a fluorescent retrofit. And we thought we should be more at the 85% level. Well, it turns out that looking at the motion sensing data, that the motion sensing, uh, really there was something going on every three minutes. So we had to rezone it, and we set the occupancy down to one minute because there was very little loitering. There's people weren't getting to know each other in the hallways. So by doing those two things uh, and then setting that remotely, we didn't have to do a truck roll or anything. Then looking back at the data two weeks later, we found that we did achieve actually 86% efficiency from the original baseline. So that's where you know, we saw an additional 50% savings just from data which um, you know wouldn't be possible otherwise um, and, and you know in this slide it says rarely fully but it's supposed to say rarely fully operational uh, without data you just can't see what's going on in the system so uh, a lot of times you know you'll have lights out you'll have things not quite working right but you won't even be aware of it inflexible uh, once again it's difficult to modify it's not software defined and it's not a platform so you can't build on it you can't if you want to make a change you have to uh, roll a truck to go out and actually make the change. So what this translates to is that you don't have data, so you can't analyze. And if you had data, you can't even adapt, even if you wanted to. Or you can, but it's so expensive that the payback has to be pretty high. Um, in other words, if you have data either from your users saying they would love to move a light, you know, a motion sensor just isn't capturing someone right, or they'd like to have a different motion sensor because it's just not working right. What, you know, there's lots of different situations just for lighting, but then well beyond that, which Cliff will talk about some of his interesting use cases, there's lots of expandability opportunities with IoT. And without being able to easily and quickly and low cost wise make changes, then even if you have all the data telling you to make a change, it just may not be economical. And so you're really neutered. You know, you're unempowered and you can't make that change. So, you know, this is a bit of a high impact statement here, being a little punchy, you know, evolve or die. But, you know, there is a reality to that of uh, if you aren't, there's just technology is disrupting every single industry 
every market. And by if you're not keeping up, which it's almost impossible to do, then you're just going to end up failing because you're going to be outcompeted by more nimble players out there. And having an infrastructure from the start that allows you to change over time and give you that flexibility, even if you fall behind in certain ways, at least you can quickly get back to where you want to be. But if there's a lot of impediments to uh, being able to make change, then you're just not going to find yourself in a good position. So the need is adaptive architecture, and this is an architectural term, uh, which is defined as uh, an architecture for buildings that adapts to environments, inhabitants, and objects entirely driven by internal data. And this slide is for me because I'm a little bit of a Trekkie, but uh, uh, basically, you know, become the Borg who is the most formidable opponent in Star Trek. It, it, and their defining quality is analyze and adapt. And, and even further, uh, you know, they would repair their ships as they're being attacked. And uh, so they're constantly regenerating and just coming at you and, and relentless. And that's how you want your competitors to see you. I mean, even in the worst of times, even when you're under fire, you want to be able to have the ability to just continue to come after uh, the market and, and dominate the market that you're trying to participate in. Um, so, you know, trying to give you the tools from a IoT perspective to accomplish that. That's what Igor's about. And where we see this process enabling you is a lean and agile strategy. And these are common terms. I won't go into all the different aspects of it, but effectively, it's this whole idea of, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. You need to plan and prioritize. You take your best guess at certain things. We're all humans. We can only do as, as good as we're aware. And because technology and things are changing so much, we have to be able to, you know, take risks, but manage risks, small risks, plan and prioritize those things that you want to accomplish as projects, deploy those bite-sized projects. So once again, they're uh, really contained risk, and, and you know, quite frankly, you're going to fail at some of those things. You, you know, you're going to deploy a, uh, some sort of system uh, off of this, and uh, for you know, managing um, you know some aspect that hasn't been thought of yet, and it may not work out quite as a market fit for your customers, but you know, you do it in a managed way, and, and for you know, one building out of your portfolio, and because of the infrastructure, it's low cost to implement that one thing. And then you can quantify those results and see, is this something you want to continue to uh, scale within your organization or not? But being able to quantify the results and, and then that will also help within the leadership teams uh, justify certain budgets and, and uh, you know, be something that you can show to your leadership as to, making progress towards certain company mandates and, and goals. So the desired outcome being a lean, agile approach, low risk, low cost, low waste, you're accelerating to uh, being able to iterate the, your business and you're getting data so you get new accountability as well as uh, higher returns. And you can pivot, uh, either iterate and, and continue to uh, go in the same direction you are but continue to scale it out, or you can pivot into new directions, but it really creates this flexible opportunity from a building facility perspective that can tightly align to what your business goals are. So what we see is, what we've developed as Igor is with that vision and with that perspective, and that's really what we're set to accomplish. So we see a lot of technology converging uh, we see a lot of silos as well, uh, but trying to unify the Internet of Things is in this unifying platform for buildings and not just working for one building, but the idea that it's buildings and, and uh, something that you can look at all of your assets, compare, contrast, and understand with a point of reference, you know, seeing baselines between your buildings as well as your peers' buildings, you get that baseline and understand how you're really doing in a holistic standpoint. Now, if we look at how 
the industry has progressed and, and just the evolution. You know, it started with LED lighting, and, you know, you could obviously trace it back further, but we're starting at LED lighting, and then we've layered on sensors and controls, and then connectivity. And then what we're starting to see some implement software. We're starting to see even fewer uh, be at the point yet uh, of implementing cloud services. And then ultimately, with all of these things in a well, uh, in, in, in all with those mandates of being something that's simple, plug and play and everything, then AI can be applied and uh, uh, other applications can easily be spun up kind of like you would on an iPhone or, or your, your mobile phone where you can just um, deploy a, an application and it will just work with your building, but applications can be shared between people. Uh, but AIs as well where um, you, you can benefit over time from all this intelligence, all this data that's gathered. So let's look at, at the technology stack layer by layer here. So we're just following the same uh, layers that I just went through. And the first one that came is, is your non-IP devices. And those are still there. You still have sensors and wall controls, relays and actuators. You have proprietary communications like wireless or serial communications. So those things are there and you want to connect them to the IP network. So to do that, uh, having IP nodes connect non-IP devices to the network. Uh, Igor, we have a, a device that has a number of terminal blocks on a small, um, what we call a node, and then you just connect up the wires to these non-IP devices to it, and now it, it's available on the network. You also have IP connected systems like the HVAC system that's already on the network. You have printers and, and other devices that you may want to power manage or you know, somehow interface with that are on the network and also IoT devices, which may actually bypass the local network and go all the way to the internet in some cases, or be available on, on the network and in the, uh, in the cloud. Once you're, you have all these devices on the IP network, then it's a matter of talking their language and routing that, that communication properly to software that would automate and manage it all. So, you know, having IP network switches, Cisco and others have uh, network switches that are readily available uh, that are now being tailored just for the digital building. Uh, Cisco has one that even ha is plenum rated that can be uh, mounted near the different devices uh, so that can also help with retrofits uh, and um, you know, by being in the plenum, it it's opens up a number of different install opportunities. And then IP device uh, software integrations, that's something else that uh, Igor spent a great deal of time with, where we don't just integrate to our own nodes, but we integrate to other systems as well. And one example would be uh, Redwood systems or BACnet. Uh, by integrating to those different systems, then, you know, we open up this as a platform that unifies all these different worlds and doesn't necessarily constrain you to uh, just those devices that uh, are newer or uh, that we can connect to via the node, but there's some devices that you know are already on the network and we want to be able to uh, allow to participate in the overall software. And then power over ethernet, you know, the simple, elegant solution to delivering both power and data. Uh, there's really just nothing that is as elegant. You, are, you have to deliver power anyway to lighting. And to sensors, yes, you could do batteries uh, and, and other things. But for the most part, uh, it's just you have to have a solution for delivering power in a flexible way that can be non-proprietary. So using ethernet cables, using standards like IP networking, and standard power over ethernet gear, which you're gonna have competition between different vendors, so you're going to get better pricing that way versus if you're stuck with a proprietary solution. You know, you're beholden to that, and you know, you can have uh, situations that occur with certain vendors if they were, you know, to go out of business or something, and, and then you're uh, gonna be in, in trouble there. So um, just having something that that really is open standards and you can find off the shelf is a great thing. 
And then local software, this is where all these things that you want to do that if the Internet was to ever go out, you want the, these particular operations to continue working. So you're talking about automations, uh, interactions between different devices, data collection, uh, you know, the policies, automations and schedules, every, all these different things. And then also, um, you know, it, it's important to have a, a developer API or SDK or and SDK, I should say, so that you can allow others and you're not beholden to a certain vendor to always create every single integration, every single local app that you want, but instead allowing them to have their own uh, IT folks do the work, which that's one of the beauties of the system it is by having it an IP solution, um, you know, it, it, it's and, and well understood using interfaces like RESTful interfaces. It just makes it very simple uh, and any IT person can get involved. BACnet, on the other hand, it's IP, but BACnet is very difficult to understand. You have to be from that industry to really get it. If you just took a normal IT person off the street and asked them to, to do something for you against BACnet, it's going to be, you know, they almost have to take a college course uh, or curriculum to, to get an understanding of how to use it. Cloud services is the next layer where all this data goes up to the cloud. And, you, you know, some people will wonder, well, why is it necessary to do this in the cloud well, instead of just locally? One of the greatest benefits is that I, you can do something, uh, what I call, you know, hive intelligence or, or um, group intelligence, which is you can understand and do comparisons between all this data in the universe. Uh, instead of just knowing what your building is, you can see it compared to all your buildings or compared to all these other customers that you don't have to know about, but it's, you know, aggregated data, so it's still private but you get more context, you get more intelligence than you otherwise would. And the way that I would attribute this is uh, similar to Tesla, where everyone drives, let's say, 20,000 miles a year. All that data, all their sensors and, and everything go up to the cloud so that they get millions of miles worth of data every year. And then they can generate artificial intelligence that drives those cars in autopilot based on that data and test against that data so they can ensure that in all the scenarios that have been driven over those millions of miles by all those different cars, they can ensure that the accident rate would be exceptionally low because they can run that AI through all the scenarios uh, instantly through uh, just the simulations of that data that they already have. So there's a great deal of benefit to adding data to the cloud and being able to utilize it where it benefits everyone. It's, it's kind of this crowdsourced uh, uh, opportunity uh, of generating artificial intelligence and, and autopilot for your buildings. Uh, remote configuration of the buildings, local software monitor and backup, as well as, yet again, API and, and SDK so that you can develop apps uh, that you don't have to be local to use them. Instead, you can uh, interface with them via your mobile phone uh, or, or interact uh, with the, the data sets that we just talked about. And in the end, all of that is just done so that you can achieve this last mile. And the last mile is where the most value is delivered. The last mile is where you can have a conversation with the customer you understand their business needs. You can understand, you, you have all this enabled power now with all sorts of data and, and ability to change your environments and easily add things or remove things or uh, just adjust things. And, and so you're empowered with all this ability to modify the environment and now leveraging that for specific business objectives that they have. And you know, safety might be quite a bit different for uh, you know, a, a school than it would be for a business. But these are just themes of apps and how you implement them. There will be numerous apps and, and, uh, and AIs uh, that will be created for each one of these initiatives. So the AI for energy optimization will be completely different than an AI that optimizes for security. And you know, they'll have to uh, also 
you know, work together in different ways and, and one taking priority versus another. But anyway, this is, uh, that last mile is the key. The other side of this is cybersecurity. It always comes up and you want to make sure you're protected. So you want these particular things in the system you choose. Uh, some of these are very forward uh, leading and aren't fully uh, available yet, but this is where things are going. So, you know, things like authentication, where you can authenticate, uh, which is basically just knowing who you are. It's an identity. So authentic, um, uh, authentication is, is that, and then authorization is, well, what is it that you're able to do? What are your permissions? But your identity, that authentication is, uh, you know, are you, you can use different servers to determine uh, if and to log in effectively and, and, um, and understand who you are. Encryption, API keys. Uh, I, API keys are a, something that uh, we've recently put into our platform, which is extremely powerful. Um, an API typically is open, and so as long as you know how to get to it, and as long as the network allows you access to it, then you can access it and, uh, and do all sorts of stuff. But instead, what we've done is so the API is locked down natively, and then you have to go into the software and generate a key, and you would provide that key to a, uh, an application that whenever it communicates with the API, it has to use that key. That way, each application can have its own key. It's very compartmentalized. If any app you no longer wanted access to the API, you could shut that particular key down, and that app no longer can log in. It can't get it can't interact with the API. So it, it's a from a platform perspective, um, if you expect lots of different uh, integrations and apps and, and ways to invent on top of the platform and innovate, well, you better have a way uh, of uh, containing each one of those initiatives. Also, uh, you know, no broadcasting or multicasting, that's more of a network terminology, but having a, a method that allows for not doing those two things uh, is pretty important. There, there's IT organizations that just really want to lock down, and um, those can be security vulnerabilities because if someone participates in a multicast group or if it's just broadcast, they can be on the network and see various traffic that's going on uh, when, they're really, when they really have no business seeing it. Uh, you can do VLANs and other things to reduce that, uh, but it's just a nice feature if you can get it. Uh, penetration testing, denial of service assessment, standards compliance, and cybersecurity assurance. Those are all upcoming things that uh, to some degree are um, just going to become more important over time, uh, but they, they are pretty much in their infancy. The penetration testing is something that's been widely used, um, but those other three are uh, a little bit more in their infancy. Complete deployment. Uh, from our perspective, looks like this. So uh, from an Igor standpoint, we try to reduce the number of network switch ports because network switches, uh, there's just another piece of uh, cost in the equation. So uh, we're trying to make it as an economical solution as possible, and we allow for daisy chaining nodes, each node being able to connect up to LEDs or sensors or to wall controls, but able to connect to a number of things and then just daisy chain one after another able to utilize the full power delivered by that uh, each port, which can be 60 watts. And that's what we would recommend is at least 60 watts per port. Uh, you can get switches that do different amounts. And then goes through the network, uh, as well as other third-party systems being available through the network. So you have all these different IP systems that then the software can see and automate, do all the things we talked about, and then communicate to the cloud, which uh, Igor has a cloud platform that enables uh, all, all, you know, the things that we recently discussed as well. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you. And uh, John, I'll give, hand it over to you. Thank you, Dwight. And very, very interesting too. Uh, we're going to come back with some questions. Uh, there's questions starting to come in uh, inevitably for, from uh, our good friends out there. Um, but we're going to hear from Cliff White, who's, who's president of Cottage Senior Living. Now, Cliff, um, I'm not sure where we would expect the, the, if you like, the initial uptake on things like power over Ethernet to come from. 
but I'm sure that not an awful lot of people would have assumed that it would have, have come from uh, the assisted living sector. Uh, until, of course, you go, well, of course you would, wouldn't you? Um, so what's, I, I hope you're going to go through this, because my, my question to you before we start is, what was it that turned you on to power over Ethernet to begin with? So, Cliff, over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, no, um, when we started looking at uh, more sophisticated lighting solutions, we really started by, uh, we got pointed in the direction of using LED lighting, tunable LED lighting, to impact circadian rhythms, uh, to, to reduce the negative impacts that traditional single color, or single heat temperature LED lighting can have on the circadian rhythms, in particular related to our residents who have dementia. Um, and so it was not necessarily an exploration of power over ethernet lighting, but, but how do we use the lighting environment uh, inside of our communities to increase the quality of life of our residents. And so um, thank you for having me this morning. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what we do and how we do it so that the context of our, our use cases for uh, the Igor technology and power of Ethernet in, in our new developments uh, has a little more context. A little bit of background on myself. Um, our company is a third generation family company. Um, we have been in operation since 1980. Uh, we operate um, what we call home style um, assisted living communities. They typically look just like your single family home in, in the south, uh, plantation style front porches. And, um, and so trying to maintain a residential field is a pretty important component of our design in those spaces. For those of you who do not know uh, the continuum of care in senior housing, generally speaking, uh, there are a range of services from independent living to memory care and or skilled nursing, uh, but we cover the spectrum that's listed on this slide. Independent living typically is uh, consumers who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, but the average age in the industry right now is about 82. Um, generally speaking, they do not require any assistance with activities of daily living, so bathing, dressing, toileting, et cetera. Um, most of the apartments in those spaces are like your typical uh, multifamily apartments, uh, one and two bedroom apartments inside some type of congregate community. Occasionally, they are built as townhomes. Um, the vast majority of the services that we provide in an independent living community are, are lifestyle uh, services. So we do activities planning um, and occasionally a la carte services like housekeeping, transportation. Uh, we do offer meals and, and other ADL assistance on an on-demand or a la carte basis. The primary bulk of our business is assisted living, um, where we are managing activities of daily living um, and assisting with activities of daily living um, with the vast majority of our res residents. We're providing health monitoring, on-site staff, 24 hours a day, um, and three meals a day, seven days a week for all of our residents. Memory care um, is growing in its need uh, based on the research that's been coming out over the last couple of years. Uh, over 50% of the population over 85 years old uh, is, has some type of cognitive impairment, whether that's mild cognitive impairment, dementia, or the uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so in memory care buildings, uh, typically, you will see egress restriction. You will see um, uh, additional staffing. Um, and the physical plant's not dramatically different from an assisted living community, from a traditional assisted living community. But there may be more um, cues 
uh, design cues that help individuals find their way home. And so there's, there's some slight differences between these products, but at the end of the day, uh, what we're trying to do is trying to provide as close to a home-like environment that is supportive and reduces the risk of further decline and improves the quality of life for, for our residents as they age. A little bit of background, uh, we are predominantly located in Alabama um, and sp spread out throughout the South, but the vast majority of our communities are in Alabama. So contextually, um, I mentioned earlier when John asked the question uh, about what brought us into uh, looking at power over Ethernet, we have in development a mixed-use senior housing community. Um, and through that design exercise, we were searching for what the right lighting solution would be for this ground-up development that would satisfy a handful of um, consumer-based needs, um, and I'll talk about those here shortly in a second. The first exploration process for Power Over Ethernet for us was a Zigbee mesh network of tunable lighting. Um, specifically, it was oriented towards maintaining behavioral issues with dementia. Um, when to prevent, prevent sundowning, exactly. Um, the difficulty that I had in terms of trying to implement that technology is that it not only required your typical high-voltage network uh, of, of lighting, but then you would add a secondary network of uh, wireless switches, um, and each lighting fixture had its own Zigbee uh, or Z-Wave uh, wireless adapter in it, and so it created this kind of secondary network that layered on top of the existing high voltage network. I thought it might be a good solution for a retrofit, but in new construction, since we were taking the risk of, call it bleeding edge technology, at least in our industry, it didn't make sense to me to double the cost of implementing a solution who that really only had one additional benefit, which was producing a lighting environment that could reduce behavioral issues in in our demented or uh, memory care residents. The second option that we looked at when exploring these um, lighting solutions was just traditional LED lighting, high voltage with a control system on top. I had the same issues with, with that that I did with the Zigbee mesh network. It's not nearly as complicated from an insulation and maintenance perspective. However, you've, you only have the ability to change the lighting environment. Additionally, if, if anybody has, out there has used um, <laughs> some of these control systems, they're not really oriented towards um, a residential implementation. And so most of, the, most of the systems that we looked at, though, would work well if we were actively managing it uh, for, on behalf of our residents, but n would not work very well when we were trying to hand that control back to our residents who were capable. And, and I'm going to reference back to our independent living customers because our independent living environment, uh, we are targeting a 65-year-old customer, not that typical 85-year-old customer that I referenced earlier. We finally stumbled across Dwight and his team and Immediately after learning about the technology and how it would impact our business via the flexibility of the node and the software application that, that lays on top of it, we recognize that not only could we impact uh, the tone of the lighting, if you will, but have other positive impacts um, or in, in our world, positive outcomes or interventions for our residents that have 
um, other issues rather than just potentially circadian rhythm impacts of being inside uh, the vast majority of their time. So why, why did we decide um, to implement in our Creekside at Trustville project this power of reef in that? Consolidate the networks between lighting and low voltage. We now no longer have to have a high voltage lighting network and a low voltage um, P, you know, POE network for our nurse call system, our Wi-Fi network, um, our PBX network. All of that, all of those three systems can be consolidated onto one network. Um, from a flexibility standpoint, we see a lot of options in the future as sensor technology continues to develop for the IoT, specifically as it relates to identifying um, ADL needs and changes in uh, what we consider the normal behavior of an individual resident. Um, our business is very dependent on understanding the needs of our residents and, ch and minor changes in their physiological and sociological behaviors to prevent major catastrophic events from happening. And so, you know, as, as, as Dwight mentioned earlier, um, evolve or die, we view this technology as a mechanism that we can add, um, add pieces of measurement into our world to capture behavior and uh, environmental statistics uh, around our residents to be able to predict their needs, not just react to their needs. The other, the other benefit is the, the energy savings over time. Um, we've already recognized in our communities a, um, or in, in our test implementation, a kilowatt hour savings just from implementing the lighting solution. How simple is the installation of the POE lighting system? Uh, what we were able to do in our office was about a day and a half to, to install or retro uh, four, roughly 40 fixtures. Uh, we used our, our existing low voltage contractor to run and patch uh, the CAT5E. We were labeled the lights by ourselves, we installed the lights ourselves, plugged it in, and started programming. Um, the advantage of these of this power reading that system, as as Dwight mentioned, is is flexibility. Um, we're in the middle of an office renovation, and we're moving desks, and individuals prefer different lighting levels, and so we have the ability to go back into the system, and change those lighting levels and preferences based on the individual's wants and needs. So, um, you know, before and after our test case here in, in our home office, uh, we're saving an average of a, you know, 1.9 uh, kilowatt hours per degree day. Um, you know, we're open five, our office is open five days a week. We should see more substantive savings from this when we, when we start our installations in our assisted living communities. But that's fairly substantive just from a lighting change when we haven't changed anything else in the building. A um, couple of quotes from our, from our employees about the flexibility and the quality of the lighting. Um, you know, we, we really didn't experience any growing pains from what I mentioned earlier might be bleeding edge technology. Um, and so we're, we've been very pleased about the quality of the light fixtures. Igor's approach obviously has been to, uh, to integrate their node into highly reputable lighting fixture manufacturers devices. And so we are confident in the future of this product. Okay, so back to the nitty gritty of, of what we're trying to do long term with the POE lighting environment. You know, we keep, we keep talking about sensors in the ceiling, uh, integrated and flexibility. 
in in our world, fall risk is an incredible issue. Um, most of our residents have some equilibrium issues. The vast majority of them use an ambulatory device like a cane or a walker. And uh, the vast majority of our residents require um, uh, toileting uh, in the middle of the night. Those, um, those three factors lead to a potential risk and a pretty significant risk for, for our residents for falls in the middle of the night. And so today's implementation or today's intervention to prevent that fall risk from being a fall in itself is that we assign a caregiver to check on the resident, ask them if they need to go to the restroom, and assist them to the restroom if necessary. In, in an Igor or, world or a POE um, sensor-connected IoT world, we will be integrating our real-time location system that we're using for uh, a nurse call system with the POE to create subtle behavioral reminders that reduce the risk of fall. As an example, as you can see on this slide, think about your process when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You, you sit up pretty rapidly, generally. Uh, you walk towards the bathroom with or without the nightlight on. Um, even if you trip uh, or stumble across something that happens to be on the floor, generally you'll, you save yourself as a younger younger person. And so what we want to do is we want to slow that process down for our residents, but not interrupt it. Just basically teach individuals and remind them with the lighting environment that they're not moving as quickly as they used to. And so um, when, you when you wake up from a dream and you think you're 30 years old in the dream, let's just make sure that we move slowly. So what we would do is we would implement a uh, a sleep sensor or a bed pressure sensor that would give us an indica early indication that the sleep pattern was changing tied to what Dwight referenced, which is the AI in the cloud adapting to, to individuals' timing needs because from our research, uh, toileting events are pretty, pretty timing dependent. If you have an individual who was on night shift for the entire, their entire working career, they are likely to still toilet on that night shift schedule, even if they have been retired for 30 years. And so um, being able to adapt that lighting environment is also very important. Once, once the person sits up, uh, they'll set their feet on the ground. We'll have a, a scale or a bed pressure, a pressure sensor on the floor that will give us an indication that, that they are seated up. We'll slowly dim the lights or slowly raise the lights, if you will. Um, and then when it is time, when, when we've had sufficient time to pass that equilibrium has stabilized, we will flash the lights in the restroom, giving them that subtle cue that you've taken enough time to stabilize. And if you start your toilet, you walk to your restroom and start your toileting event. Same thing on the, way, on the return. Instead of having to have a, a night light in the building or in the resident's apartment, you use the Igor lighting to tune up and tune down the lighting environment to not disrupt sleep patterns, but at the same time create a safe walking environment. As I mentioned earlier, the other the primary use that we were looking at more sophisticated lighting was for circadian rhythms. The vast majority of our residents are inside all day long. They, there are windows, there are doors, they can go outside. But just like in your office environment, um, LED lighting can, can impact circadian rhythms and, and create issues with um, sleep, sleep patterns. At least that's what the ongoing research is saying. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned in the previous use case, you, we still see in individuals who had night shift routines for their, the entirety of their career, 
behaviors that are still exist in today's world uh, that that uh, <laughs> um, we want to be able to adapt to. And so ultimately the goal with um, POE lighting is to be able to adjust the lighting environment to meet the residents' needs to provide the highest quality of life over time. Um, the other, so as we've been exploring this new installation in new construction, one of the issues that we have come across is interactions with architects and engineer, building engineers uh, who their primary goal is to produce a product that is that will last for 30 years. And, and my definition of last has tended to be a little bit different than, than, um, than our engineers' uh, definition of lasting. And so we've, we've had quite a few conversations about why this is important and why we have to integrate it into new construction rather than force ourselves to have to renovate uh, down the road when this type of lighting environment or building infrastructure becomes a necessity rather than a, um, a want. Um, as an example, uh, so to approach reducing the overall initial implementation cost, we've started to integrate the other components of our building environment, digital signage for menu boards, activity planning, et cetera. Um, we, our wireless access points will be on the same network as the Igor POE. Um, our PBX will be on the same Powerover Ethernet network. And uh, we are actively searching for smart door locks that are uh, POE powered. That's a much harder find in today's world. What we really hope to see um, coming out of this POE and IoT innovation is uh, resident, residential grade telephones. It would be nice to be able to provide a very simple, um, you know, the equivalent of a cordless phone or a, a standard corded phone uh, for our residents uh, using POE so it ties into the PBX but doesn't, you know, isn't a $200. Um, business multi-line um, POE phone. The other thing that we that I would like to see down the road is uh, simple integration with other household devices like thermostats or uh, wireless charging pads, um, at more consumer-related technology. Because remember, my most of my environment is is residential. And so I'm not the typical user for a product like this or a typical early adapter for a product like this. But once you start to think about how you can use the intelligence and the flexibility, our business is just like any other where you, where you have to adapt to the needs of your customers or, you know, as Dwight said, evolve or die. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, to talk about how we intend on using Power Over Ethernet in our physical spaces. And I, I, I'm looking forward to a lot of the um, questions that have been popping up over the last couple of minutes. John? Yes, Cliff, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we can, any of us can imagine what a, a typical POE client looks like at the minute. Um, so <laughs> I. <laughs> Uh, but I think what you've just described is, is uh, vitally important to, to, to everyone who maybe doesn't understand what the application of the data is about, that it does come down to helping people to live. You're in a very um, acute uh, part of the world with that, in, in that, you, you, that you are really helping people to live the most independent life they can. And it's almost as you, you know, dare I say, you're like the guardian angels for these people. That uh, that there's that, that you're in a, you're getting out of their way by ensuring that the data is providing you with the information that you need to keep them safe. Is that a fair fair way to say it? Absolutely. Um, I, I have one one of our business hypotheses is that technology tends to outpace people. Um, you know. 
think back to your grandparents, uh, or at least my grandparents, they grew up on, on pre-radio. And, uh, you know, when the television came around, they struggled to use just an eight-channel television. And now that we've got uh, televisions that have Netflix and Hulu and stream, stream from whatever device you want, wherever you want, at whatever time, uh, the ability to keep up with the technological evolution. Uh, so I view our, our job is to use technology, as you said, to be the guardian angel, but to support those lives, make somebody else's life easier and better using what we can find and implement effectively. Thank you. Yes. Now, um, we've had quite a few questions. What I'm going to do here, because we, because we've, um, we're, we're not, we've not got that much, lot, much, much time left to, to deal with the Q and A's. So those of you who've been asking specific questions, I'm going to ask Dwight and Cliff between them to divvy up those, those, those questions and answer, answer them outside of the, uh, the webinar. I trust that's okay, um, because what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time. If you like looking at it from the, from the from the systems perspective, because I know there's a lot of people who are with us today who are uh, they're, they're deeply engaged in the light in the lighting industry, they're deeply engaged in 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 the whole uh, Internet of Things, and there and th the questions are still bouncing around about how we make this work. Um, I'm interested as a lighting designer in if I end up in a, having a conversation with a client who's running a care home and I've now got a fantastic uh, example of, of what I can talk to them about but um, this is for Dwight really um, when I'm looking at lighting specifications uh, am I looking at the same old fittings but it's just different it's a different box on the back is it something mm -hmm. is it as simple as that yeah I'm going to show a slide um Let's get back to my deck. I had a, this slide kind of waiting if that question came up. Uh, it, it really is that simple for not only lights, but just for uh, any non-IP device. So uh, you, you, we license to OEMs. So we're working with Hubble. We're working with H.E. Williams. We're working with others. And those companies just, uh, they, they put the node into their fixtures just like they do a regular LED driver and then deliver that to their customers. And so then it's just plug and play when it arrives to your site, uh, and it's easy enough to wire up sensors and wall controls uh, as well. And then it's just a matter of uh, turning it on, really, at that point. I mean, it's really just plug and play, and you, you, then you do have to configure the spaces, and, and as you plug things in, you see those different devices show up, and you just associate them to spaces. And But it, it's a very, very simple process. and We've made it as easy to adopt as possible by working with the OEMs. If you want a specific fixture that uh, there is no OEM that's licensing from us yet, then it's also rated, UL rated as a retrofit as well as plenum. So you could uh, attach the node to a, a fixture and you just provision it uh, to uh, operate at the uh, electrical requirements of that fixture. And, and and then it just works. So it, it's really simple. It, it's uh, designed to be so. So by if 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 I if I now sort of dig a little bit deeper in, into the design process, um, if we are looking for if you like an an an, an establishment embracing of POE, it, it's going to mean that the the guys designing the buildings need to buy into it. The the guys who are designing the services for the buildings need to go into it. And so things like BIM modeling will come into play. And it's mm -hmm. almost as if, if you're not, well, sorry, but if, you, if you're not coming out with the, the, the data required to, to, to put into a BIM model, we can't help you. Is that something else that you're looking at as, as, as part of the, the bridge into, into the, uh, the world as we currently know it? Yeah, so we do take, uh, you know, reflective ceiling plans and other data, and we can help provide uh, that in, in a uh, package that, that can be provided for bids um, or in quotes. Uh, so we can help OEMs do that. We can help, uh, you know, the reseller channel do that. Uh, you know, we also work with IT integrators and integrators in general. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of 
um, we fully respect that this is, uh, you know, something that's unfamiliar territory and has some components here that uh, are, you know, technological. And, and so we provide tier two support. Uh, the cloud is really helpful for that where we can monitor sites and, and the devices remotely. So, you know, we've got uh, installs going on in Australia and in China and India and the UK and uh, we just wouldn't feel uh, we wouldn't feel good about those, and, and our brand name is very important to us and making sure we always have success for our customers, so that um, we can monitor, we can be there for uh, for them, and, and make sure that these installs are rock solid. Um, okay. So, you know, we have the tools and, and resources to do that. Okay, I, I think this is going to be the, the last question. Looking at the time, um, we talked about flexibility in in the system um, but we're also and but the one of the questions that keeps coming up and 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 I think all those of us who've been used to tungsten halogen lighting and fluorescent lighting and all the rest of it will still be looking at 60 watts as being good grief but that's a tiny tiny load but I would say that this week I've been looking at a new LED panel that's using uh, 150 lumens per watt LED chips and for the first time that I can remember um, we've got a lighting manufacturer who is not just ramping up the power but they're actually dropping the light the, the loading in the fitting in order to maintain the light output because they're comfortable with how much light they're producing now they can enjoy doing it for a lower energy so that 60 watts is is is, is, is that's sort of working in, in in your favor working in all our favors but how flexible is a system that if you you design the system uh, the client comes back i mean this this could be what, what cliff would be doing in in a couple of years time um there's an extension to a building or there's a new facility or there's a new requirement the point is that there's a new requirement for more power how does the new stuff connect into the old stuff yeah that, that that's the beauty of power over ethernet it, it's very flexible and backward compatible so there's new standards that are coming out that are for 90 watts support, for instance, uh, but it will continue to be backward compatible with the, the previous uh, supply uh, of 60 watts. And you know, as these devices lower their power requirements, you know, that they'll just enjoy being able to have more devices on a daisy chain. You know, that's a, a huge benefit uh, to. Um, the whole system, um, you know, you, you kind of have this, we're already there where it, it's economical and, and you're enjoying all these different benefits the way that it is today. But, yeah, it's, it's going to become more and more economical over time where 60 watts, yeah, it doesn't sound like much, but actually because of the way LEDs already are and, and because of uh, where they're moving to, there's very few applications that can't use PUE. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm st I, I think I'm becoming a bit of an expert on this. As long as, as long as nobody asks me a question, I shall be fine. Um, I'll just refer them to, to you, Dwight. Uh, now, everyone, I'd like to thank you all for your time. It's, it's now uh, a few minutes uh, beyond the top of the hour. Um, I've really enjoyed that. Cliff, it's been great hearing uh, the real practical way that, the, that, this is, that this is now taking place. I think I'll just put my name down for one of your places, and I'll come and live with you for a little while. <laughs> um, hope to speak to everyone again soon. Um, we have got, what have we got? Uh, next week in London, we have a one-day conference on connected lighting in retail, and that is free for retailers to come along to so they can learn more about how the Internet of Things and all these various uh, aspects of, of, of connected lighting um, is coming into play in the retail environment. And, of course, in November, we have... Live, where there will be more conversations that you can st shake a very big stick at, all talking about the new connected world that we're enjoying. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you, Cliff. And uh, I wish you all a very happy day. Thank you. Thank you.